start of spring when it's tomato class. So, uh, and we've got some, well, at least it's not cold. It's not snowing. So, uh, start off with tomatoes. I'll uh, we'll talk about how to, the culture and all that, but first thing, one of the more interesting topics would be what's an heirloom versus a hybrid versus a GMO. So we're split about even on selling uh, hybrids and heirlooms. They both have their advantages. Uh, GMO, the things that are created in laboratories, not naturally. Uh, there was one that was created in the 1980s, I believe it was I can't remember the name now, Flavor Saver or one of those, where they put a gene from, and I don't recall what animal it was, they put in the tomato to keep it, uh, to extend its shelf life. So it wouldn't rot on the, sh you know, they thought well, for supermarkets uh, they could make it last longer, but didn't taste that good, no one pursued it, so that's gone. So at, at this point, uh, as far as we know, there are no GMO tomatoes uh, artificially genetically modified tomatoes out there, but there certainly are a lot of heirlooms and hybrids. So the definition, I mean, in th you know, the old definition of heirloom was something that was a regional tomato that people loved and kept it going for at least 50 years, but there's no way to track that. So all they know is the genetics are pretty stable. So there's heirlooms, And there's hybrids. Well, what a hybrid is, and all it is, is the daughter of two heirlooms, two different heirlooms. So heirlooms tend to be genetically pure plants, um, and hybrids tend to be genetically diverse plants, where heirlooms, uh, most tomato plants that we know of have two sets of chromosomes, just like we do. And with heirlooms, uh, they've been throwing away the oddballs over decades and decades so that all the chromosomes seem to be consistent and no matter what you do you get out something that's similar. Now it's not perfect. Uh, you can get a real weird one now and then just because genes go funny sometimes. Uh, and tomatoes, you know, like fruit trees, we sell cultivars. Those are clones of the parent. With t vegetables, most tomatoes, not all of them, most tomatoes are varieties because if you throw a bunch of seeds in the ground, every one is genetically different. They're very similar, but they're genetically different. So you can say, well, uh, heirloom is a race of one, is one race. Like, these are all, quote, Caucasian tomatoes. And a hybrid is when you mix the races so that their babies are quite different uh, and have genes from both. So heirlooms, uh, what they do to make them is they'll have, now most heirlooms start out as being a hybrid, a natural hybrid. So here someone got something real different and it looked really cool and tasted and real neat. Well, they take the seeds from those plants and grow them, but they get all kinds of kids. They save the ones that look the most like the one they want, and after seven generations of that, generally the genetics become pretty lined up and, and even and without too many oddballs in there, and then they call it from that point an heirloom. So you can turn any hybrid into an heirloom within, they said, seven generations. So a lot of famous hybrids became heirlooms in the trade after you know, somebody took the seeds. Now, the, the reason why they want to make heirlooms out of hybrids is because the hybrid, you've got to save both parents. And you want to save, you know, save that plant indefinitely. And then they have to take a little paintbrush and take the pollen from one parent and put it on, the, take the pollen from one and put it on the female parts of the other, bag it so that there's no additional pollen to get in there. And then you grow the fruit and sell the seeds and those seeds are the hybrid seeds. It's expensive to make hybrids because someone's got to do that operation. You know, two separate enclosed areas with no chance of crossbreeding, um, and then they have to save the seeds, and those seeds are then 
they call them F1 hybrids, the first generation after you cross them. So um, the hybrid seeds, like we've got, we sell seeds of both hybrids and heirlooms. So this heirloom seeds, uh, less than $1.89 for 30 seeds, but you get a hybrid, even from the same company, $3.89 for 10 seeds. So these seeds were like uh, seven or eight cents a piece. In fact, these seeds were uh, less than that, be six cents a piece. And these seeds are 30, uh, almost 40, 39 cents a piece for those seeds in there. So it's over three or four times as much for a hybrid seed than a heirloom where you just take fruit from ones that look right and you save the seeds from those. So, so someone on the hybrid side. Now, tomato plants, the other way of producing them other than seeds is take cuttings and then just keep rooting them and keep them going forever. Then you clone it. So the people who do hybrids, they've cloned their plants over and over and over and over throughout the years, even several generations now. So they have that same parent still. And they have the, the two, hi, two heirlooms that are the same, and they keep crossing them to get the hybrid seeds. So there is one uh, advantage. If you, if, you, if you grow a seedling tomato, which all these are, and you find you have an exceptionally good one, you might want to clone that instead of taking the seeds out and having that chance again of being... Because we, when we grow tomato seeds, we find that about one out of every ten just fails and dies, gets sick and dies right off, right out of the... Uh, seedling thing. So we know that every so often you get an, uh, one that's not right. It's just, well, it's like your kids. One out of every so many is just not right. So uh, so if you find one that's really incredibly good, you might want to save it and uh, clone it. And to do that, I mean, tomato cuttings are about the easiest cutting to take. If you break off a stem of a tomato and stick it in clean dirt, It'll wilt for a few days. You can throw a plastic bag over it to prevent too much wilting, and then it starts to grow. So you can take that plant over and over and over. Now, the disadvantage over time is that, especially if you have it outdoors in a garden, is that along the way it may pick up viruses that aphids or some other critter introduced to it. Then you have some trouble. You have to start over again. But if you find a really good one, you might want to just take a clone and keep it over winter and keep it going. Um, the other thing to know about tomatoes is that, just like any crop, we have to rotate them. And the reason for that is anytime you have a, a plant, say, in your garden, the ground around it fills with tomato roots, and those roots are growing and dying, growing and dying. At the end of the season, you pull out your plant, and now you, you, know, you can pull out the big roots, but most of the small, fine hair roots are left in the ground, and now you've got a soil with maybe a uh, one t small tomato root every quarter inch. It's only like, it's less than 1% of the soil volume, but every quarter inch there's a dead tomato root. And uh, the next year, if you put a new tomato plant in that, it's not liking it as much as if it was virgin soil. Now, most tomatoes you can grow in the same soil two years in a row. First year, fabulous. Second year, not quite as good, but still, you're, you, you've done okay. By the third year, you've grown tomato plants in the same soil. It's a disaster. They turn yellow and die within a, a few months of planting. And that's because there's so much dead root from the previous years. It's like trying to live in a house with your dead, dead relatives in there. It just doesn't work after a while. So you have to plant it someplace else. So, so it's nice to have in a vegetable garden at least three beds. I mean, at minimum two, but... Um, like we were next to an organic farm for four years and they said they were on a 10 crop rotation cycle. So they would grow 10 crops of something unrelated before they grew the same crop again. Well, that takes three to four years to do that. So, so when you plant another crop in that tomato soil, it, the little tomato roots don't bother this? Not if it's not related. So if you kill, yeah, if you kill fish in your house, it generally doesn't bother you. If you kill insects in your house, it generally doesn't bother you. If you kill a monkey, it would bother you. But most animals that are not related closely 
you know, turtles, if they die in your house, you're not going to be affected because the diseases that affect the dead bodies of those don't usually affect humans. I mean, mammals are closer, but, you know, generally you have to get pretty close to us before it really is a, a nasty problem. So, um, so, like, yeah, you can kill any plant in your house and it won't, you won't notice. <laughs> you know, plants are not anything related to us, so, uh, you know, it's not a problem for dead plants. In fact, we live in dead houses, I mean, dead trees. That's where we're living. So, um, okay, so hybrids um, have to be done generally in greenhouses, uh, and they're done by big companies. Now, most hybrids were bred for one purpose. Uh, well, more than one, but originally they were bred for one purpose, to live among dead tomato plants. So most hybrid, let me see if they are still doing it. They used to really make sure they had the notations on the tags. So like one of the plants, and we'll go over these later, that's considered one of the most incredible hybrids is big beef. And they don't have it on the tag anymore. But they used to say what it was bred to be resistant to. Um, so they, uh, I don't know, they're not doing it on the tags anymore, but they would put letters like V, F, N, T, um, and some even had an A on there. Well, these are the diseases that this plant is resistant to, and big beef was resistant just about to everything that they had. Verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, nematodes, these are all root diseases that accumulate when you've grown tomatoes in that spot before. So this guy is bred to live among dead tomatoes. So, need some, need some room here. Okay. He wants to sit in the box. <laughs> so, so these were successful because people can plant them in the garden year after year and, and still get a good crop without having to rotate as much. The heirlooms were bred primarily for flavor. So they're really tasty, you know, unusual flavors that you might not be able to get in a hybrid because hybrids are mixed parents. But if you try to grow them in the same spot twice, forget it. Most of them are, you know, there's a few that can do it. But most of them, you try to grow them in the same spot the second year, it's a disaster. They weren't bred to do that. Uh, big beef, I had a plant in my yard make it over three winters it survived. Wow. It died on its fourth year, but I just want to see how long it can live, and it was incredible. So, so Burpee, back in the 1940s, started creating, because they wanted, because Back in those days, tomatoes were hit and miss for for most homeowners. So Burpee created the first hybrid called Big Boy. And uh, it became real famous because people can grow it, and they can grow it in their garden a second year, and it would still do okay. So people thought, boy, this is really a good um, variety of tomatoes. So they uh, that made Burpee world famous, and they've done a lot of, Big boy, better boy, early girl, better girl. Um, I'm not sure if Big Beef was one of theirs, but they've done a whole line of those over the years, and the genetics are kept pretty secret, which heirlooms that they put in there to create them. So, Okay, so as far as growing them, uh, you know, they do just as well in pots as they do in the ground. Um, the soil temperature doesn't seem to affect them as much as it does some plants. So, you know, generally if you're in a container, the soil in the pot is about as hot as the air. So it gets colder at night and warmer in the day. And during the summer, if it's 100 degrees, this soil is going to be 100 degrees. In the ground, the soil rarely gets above 90, if ever. Unless it's you know unless you don't have uh, mulch cover or some kind of mulch on top or it's not shading the soil, so uh, containers the soil temperature goes all over the place. But tomatoes don't seem to be that badly affected. Plus, usually by summer they've put it such a big canopy of leaves over it, 
it helps shade the pot a little bit too. But we do well in pots. Um, generally, a five gallon bucket would be as small as we'd recommend, although there are some really small tomato plants that can go in smaller pots, but five gallon is about it for outdoor use. Now, it is true in uh, hydroponics in greenhouses, they use a lot smaller container than this, maybe half the size, and they can keep that plant going for years and years, but they don't have quite the stress in there, and, they, and it's totally controlled. They can water three or four times a day or even more than that so that the soil that they use or the growing medium that they use, and sometimes it's, it's plastic, <laughs> uh, doesn't have to hold the moisture for the entire day, whereas unless you've got your thing automatically watered, it's, you, know, you water once a day at the most and it'll dry out and the plant will suffer. So it's nice to have a bigger pot. Uh, most of the real people into it that grow tomatoes in pots will use something about this size. Now, these can be hard to store. They make uh, burlap bags that you can grow tomatoes in too. These will stay marginally cooler in the summer than these. Uh, you know, if you're in the deep south or near Sacramento where it just stays hot day and night, uh, their burlap bags can make a big difference. Here, you know, we're not, you know, compared to most of the U.S., we're considered a cool summer climate. Not last summer, but in general, if you're in the 80s, you're actually <laughs> kind of a cool summer climate. So uh, it's not as essential, but a lot of people use these. Now, these aren't all that cheap. They're fun. This is $20. And this is about the size of this, maybe a, about three or four years, yeah. And plastic, same thing. Um, this one that they grow use for tomatoes is 20 gallons, so it's quite a bit larger than this one. And that's what they're promoting for tomatoes. I would say the eggplant one's big enough. Oh, I see, so they, just one tomato plant in that? Right, right. And it depends how you want to train your tomato plant, too. So we'll go over that here in a second. Um, now, the potting soil we usually use in pots or in the ground is our acid mix. How many of you haven't been to my soil class before? Everybody has, pretty much. So you know why we recommend this. Uh, if you haven't, then we're talking about it next week at our, uh, another soil class. But our acid mix is generally what we use to grow tomatoes. Our other one will work too. This holds water a little better. And fertilizer wise, um, tomatoes aren't that unique among vegetables. If you just want to throw in a good organic fertilizer, Dr. Earth is one of the better brands. Uh, this one works a little slower than this one. This one costs a little more than this one. Uh, a lot of farms would rather use something like this. What they've done here is this is a mixture of organic materials, and this is the same mixture, similar mixture of organic materials that's been fermented halfway so it works faster. So this smells okay. This one smells like a sewer. But I remember when we were next to that organic farm for four years, whenever they fertilized, it smelled like you're next to a sewer. <laughs> so they're using fermented things because they work faster which for a farm is critical. For a homeowner, may not be as critical. I mean, there are a lot of things that... That's, yeah, that's certainly uh, all the organics, you know, they have dead animals and dead things in them. So, I mean, it, you know, you can use a good chemical fertilizer like Osmocote, uh, especially if you're in a pot. It's not essential. You know, the nice thing about organics is to keep the soil fluffier. So if you're using real dirt, organic matter feeds the organisms that's in the soil that keep the ground nice and fluffy. And in the long run, organics are generally better than chemicals. But if you're just running a crop in a pot, one crop, this is a very quite accurate chemical fertilizer. Um, this is the best-selling fertilizer in the U.S. as far as nurseries are concerned, just because they've done a good job and put just about every mineral that's in the organic in here. So it's really complete. Um, if you're doing hydroponics, then the stuff from Fox Farm is real accurate, too. They have uh, their line of uh, hydroponic 
fertilizers. Most of these are also chemical. I don't know, when you're using hydroponics and you put organic stuff in there, everything starts growing in the water. Algae and bugs and everything. Um, as far as critters goes, there's the, of course, there's the big famous tomato hornworm. That's that real big caterpillar that gets on there usually in July. It doesn't usually come out in, before July unless we've got a really hot spring, which we haven't had for years now. Uh, if spring's real hot. We notice that um, the these caterpillars pupate in the ground. The pupae, the big giant pupas, which are not big too, uh, stay dormant at least through June. Uh, but if the soil warms up before then, they'll wake up sooner, start flying around like hummingbirds and lay eggs on your tomato plants. And uh, that caterpillar has a lifespan of four weeks. The first week it's that big, it eats maybe one quarter of a leaf. The second week it's a little bigger and it eats maybe two leaves. Third week, it's that big, and suddenly it starts eating entire branches of your plant. And by the fourth week, yeah, it can eat the whole plant. <laughs> so, and there are, they've got about three or four generations all the way into December. So, um, now, a pretty simple way to stop that one. So, there's an organic product that contains a chemical called spinosad. Spinosad was, uh, the bacteria that makes this was found in a distillery in the Caribbean islands, so they call this Captain Jack's dead bug brew playing off of, I guess, the Pirates of the Caribbean. But spinosad is a real important organic pesticide. Even though we drink it when we drink rum, it kills uh, just about any chewing bug you know. Um, so caterpillars, uh, doesn't do say the brown grasshoppers, but will kill the green ones, uh, beetles, um, pill bugs, um, things that like to chew holes. Plus it does thrips, which is real important nowadays too. It kills thrips, which is a, not a true chewing bug. It kind of slices and dices and sucks out whatever emerges from the holes it makes. But spindle said real important, uh, last two weeks on the plant. Uh, since that caterpillar with the tomato hornworms takes two weeks to get big enough to do major damage, if you sprayed this once a month on your tomato, you wouldn't see them. They're just too small between sprays. If you don't, if you don't want any caterpillars in your plant at all, spray every two weeks, but it, you can get by with once a month on it. Um, the other bugs aren't as big a problem. There are several types of caterpillars that eat the fruit and the leaves, and tomato horns that eat the fruit and the leaves. And there's some tomato, uh, well, the caterpillar that eats corn also eats tomato fruit, fruit worms. Um, but most of them are, and there's a few beetles that go after them too. This will control that also. Now for sucking bugs, if you have too much of a problem, like aphids, white fly sometimes we get real bad, spider mites. Spider mites are, can be really nasty. They're actually little spiders that live on the leaves that will pierce one cell of the leaf at a time, inject a toxin in there, just like what spiders do to insects. They catch it, pierce it, put a toxin in there that liquefies all the internal organs and then suck out the contents and then you got a shell of an insect left. They do the same thing with cells of plants. Their spider mites are real tiny, so they pierce one cell at a time, suck out the contents, and the leaves start turning lighter because they're sucking out the green cells of each one until they, it kind of turns gray. They leave real tiny spider webs. They can really devastate tomato. They don't kill it, but they'll certainly shut, shut down the growth. Um, water actually will, if you blast them with water, because before we had the oils, we just blast with water real hard once a week and after three weeks of that, you pretty much knocked them all off. So water is still fine. But one shot of one of the oils, uh, this is a mineral oil, and this is the plant oil, neem oil, mineral oil. They both kill by suffocating the little bugs. And you cover them up, they breathe through their skin, through holes in their skin. If you cover them with oil, they'll be suffocated in about half an hour. The plant can hold its breath for a day or so. 
So uh, the oil evaporates, it's gone, there's no residue, and then the plant can breathe again. Uh, they're both safe for consumption within a day. They just don't, they don't really, they can't hurt you. They're, this is like uh, putting um, hand lotion on your hands. This neem oil is actually a little harsher than this one. Uh, it's got a little sulfur in it, so it smells more. Might be a little more effective against certain bugs than this oil, but they're, they're pretty close. They're pretty equivalent. The neem costs about twice as much as the horticultural oil or uh, mineral oil. So. Now, with all this rain, if it doesn't stop raining, you can get some diseases. Um, the disease that wiped out the potatoes, and potatoes are close related to tomatoes, in uh, Ireland, that was called uh, early blight. Might have been late blight, but early blight. Uh, so if, it missed, if it's misty for days and weeks on end, then you can get that uh, garden foss, which is probably the least chemical of the fungicides, will help stop that one. Um, we spray this in the nursery whenever we have rain on certain plants to stop it. It's really a fertilizer. So in certain uh, states, well, in most states, this product is labeled as a fertilizer. It's monon potassium salts of phosphorus acid. Both potassium and phosphorus are fertilizers. Phosphorus is heavily involved in fighting disease. You beef up the phosphorus content, it helps stop the diseases. So this one is, 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 a, is a good alternative to a regular chemical, chemical uh, fungicide, which I hate to use, rather, you know, just plant a new plant. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, the other thing that happens in tomatoes, certain ones, um, especially the bigger tomatoes, like the, called the beefsteak, the real big one-pounders, they often get, and even some of the smaller ones, often get a hard, dark area at the bottom of the fruit. And that's called blossom and rot. It's not really a rot. It's not rotting. It's just a hardened flesh area. Uh, similar things happen in peppers, squash, cucumbers, apples, pears, and a few other fruits. And it's a lack of calcium in that fruit. So some of the bigger apples, like John Gold, huge apples, um, Mutsu apple, really big apples, Apple's so big, the, the plant just can't get enough calcium in that fruit. Even if there's a lot of calcium in the ground, the plant can't get enough calcium in the fruit to finish it. So part of the flesh hardens. And same with tomatoes. The bigger tomatoes, sometimes, on, especially on young plants, even if your soil has enough calcium in it, it just can't pick up enough of it to finish off that fruit properly. So they make these sprays. Now this is called tom tomato blossom spray. So it helps the flower set fruit. But this one's called Rot Stop, and it's primarily meant, uh, made to stop tomato blossom end rot. They call them blossom end because it's the far end of the tomato where the flower was sitting. For also for use on cucumbers, melons, and peppers, and I would tell you apples too, but it's uh, calcium 1.6%, and you spray it right on the developing fruit. So when the fruit starts to grow, once a week you just spritz it once, and uh, it's supposed to stop. And I don't know if milk has enough to do that, too. I don't think milk is quite enough. But who knows? It might be just enough to stop it from happening. But this is meant to do that for you, just calcium. Stronger source of calcium. You can put gypsum on the ground. But again, sometimes it's the plant. It's not the, the soil that's lacking calcium. So, And they say as most tomato plants age, mature after a few months the blossom and rot stops on its own the plant gets enough calcium up there so okay um now how to train it so commercial farms especially the greenhouse ones they have their own method of training tomato plants that most homeowners don't use so if you grow a tomato plant yourself, usually what they do is they start the branch as they grow. 
So instead of one stem, you end up with 10, 15 stems all growing out in their own direction. Now, if you're growing a plant in a greenhouse and you set them, say, two feet apart, and you want to keep it that way for years and years, you can't let it side branch. You, you can't do that. You don't have enough room for all that you know, exponential growth that the plants can make. So in a greenhouse situation, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll have their little growing medium, which might be a cube of polystyrene or something like that. And they'll grow that plant straight up and attach to uh, the most popular method is on the roof here, they'll have a string coming down and they'll put little clips on the plant and as it grows up, they'll just keep on attaching more clips to it to go straight up that rope. And soon what happens, and they'll, if the plant tries the side branch out of the leaves on the sides of it, they'll just pick those side branches off. Now, out of the crotch are the Inside of each leaf, there's a bud. Uh, every leaf has a bud, most leaves do. And it can either be a branch or a cluster of flowers, sometimes it's both. So if it's leaves coming out, a new branch coming out, they'll just get their little pinky fingernail in there and pull it out, break it off, and they'll leave the flower buds as they grow. So as this plant grows up higher and higher, you know, somewhere maybe a foot behind the tip, it's starting to bloom, and the fruit starts developing. So the fruit's developing as the plant's growing. Keep on clipping it up here. Plant keeps growing. So eventually they'll have a crop forming right about here that you can pick with smaller fruit above it. and then uh, flowers above that and they continues to grow. Now as the plant grows higher and higher these are picked and they're done. And what they do is then they take the leaves off, pull off the leaves so it's just a naked stem. And then what they do is they will just coil the old stem on the floor below the plant, let the rope come down a little bit and keep on letting the, the plant grow up that same rope and after several years, you can have like 20 feet of, of tomato stem laying on the floor of this greenhouse with the same plant growing the same way up that string. So that's how the, it's done a lot in hothouses. Uh, so that each plant has the same stem next to the next one, next to the next one, for years and years and years. They pull off the leaves because the dead leaves can create situations for diseases. So that's just clean stem on the dirt here. So if you know anyone who's grown tomatoes in a hothouse, he only wants one stem on his plant. So we had a gentleman, uh, in fact, used to call him Mr. Tomato, Steve Goto. He would come in and show us pictures of all his tomato plants in 15-gallon buckets. He didn't like the cages. He had one um, big two-inch stake in the center of each pot and grew his plant, and it was an eight-foot stake, and he just grew his plant straight up the stake. He didn't know any way else to grow tomatoes, so... He promoted that one, and that was fine, because that's how they did it in the hothouses he had seen. So that's what he was trying to do. That's what he liked. He always had a good crop. He grew like uh, 300 varieties. Of, no, I, I think he always pared it down every year to less than 200. It's crazy, though. He was growing so many varieties of tomatoes. Now, interestingly, there is something called tomato mania. So at my aunt's old nursery in Pasadena, uh, her my uncle ran a nursery called uh, Fair Oaks Gardens. It was my dad's nursery before he moved out to Orange County. But my uncle grow, uh, had it there. And then after he died, my aunt rented the place out to Gary Jones, uh, who, was, who had a gentleman by the name of, uh, I can't remember his name now. Uh, starts with, last name started with a D. But he was into tomatoes, so they would actually contract out with five or six growers, and they would grow 400 varieties of tomatoes. I mean, he only had a nursery that was 
same size as this one. And they would offer 400 tomatoes every spring. They'd send a flyer out to everyone, I think, in Southern California. Uh, I mean, I used to get in the mail in Mission Viejo. This flyer with 400 tomatoes listed on it that he was going to have in March, late March or early April every year. This is crazy. Um, their parking lot held five cars. Well, you know, uh, he ran, I mean, he was, I don't know, he, he became something like $2 million in debt after five years uh, and went under <laughs> and drugged the, most nurseries down with him, but um, he didn't have a good accountant working for him, a bookkeeper, so that was the problem. But anyway, it was an interesting thing. But uh, that tomato mania, the guy that was running it at his store decided he would make it an, an event throughout Southern California. So I don't know if he's still going with it, but uh, they would have it at the Rose Bowl, at big nurseries, brought Rogers Garden sometimes. Uh, uh, and they would, they would have like 400 varieties of tomatoes. So it was just, uh, you know, there's just so many. It's like, yeah, how, I mean... When I listened to Steve Goto talk about tomatoes, he used to come to our store and we'd have huge crowds and he'd be talking about 100 varieties. Well, after about 20 of them, you kind of lose track of what he's talking about because each one is the best tomato ever. <laughs> so it's like, okay. <laughs> so we kind of stopped making description guides because they all sound the same. You know, there's so many good ones. And every year with the different weather conditions, certain ones will stand out. And the next year, totally another set of tomatoes will stand out. So we kind of go with a few that we've learned to like over the years that are pretty reliable. So I'll go over some of those with you. Um, one note, if you really want to grow, start seeds this time of year, um, the problem with tomato seeds is the soil has got to be really warm for them to come up well. So if we've, even in our greenhouse, which this time of year can get up into the 70 degrees, maybe even 80 on some sunny days, Tomato seeds just don't start well. It's just too cool. You need something really warm. So this setup here, um, it's got a little plastic dome on top. Now that's important if you're starting seeds that need warm dirt. Because if you just have a pot that's open to the air, the water's evaporating. It's keeping that thing cooler than the air because the water's evaporating. If you, if you suddenly cover with the plastic dome, water doesn't evaporate. So it's automatically warmer. And then you put a heat mat underneath it, which keeps the whatever's above it 20 degrees warmer than the ambient temperature. Then, you know, if your house is 70, then the soil suddenly becomes 90 degrees, and you'll get some tomato seeds to start growing. Because we notice when we used to grow tomatoes in our greenhouse, it'd have to be like 100 degrees in there, and suddenly all the tomato seeds would just come up. Every single one would sprout. At about 70 or 80, you know, one out of 10 would sprout. But at 100, you know, you can fill it in there, 100 degrees, every seed would just come up real fast. So it's got to be, I would say, above 90 to get those tomato seeds to really start growing well. So a heat mat is important and a covered uh, tray. You know, you can, you can just use Tupperware, something to cover your tray to keep it from evaporating, keep it warm in there. That really helps the tomato seeds come along or just buy the plants. Um, Okay, let's go over some of the better varieties. Oh, one, more, one more thing, okay. So if you want to grow your plants incredibly fast, we've talked about this at the previous lecture, so there's a formula that has been used for a long time that you spray on them constantly, and it's fish emulsion, which is a good source of nutrition, and it's seaweed extract, which is a growth hormone, and it's molasses, which is your sugar source. You put these three together uh, evenly, about one ounce per gallon of each one, and spray the foliage of your plants with it. They just take off and get going. So you have the fertilizer, which is the building materials. You have the sugar, which is the energy to make them. You know, plants make sugar from sunlight. Uh, but if this is like, a, like you're giving them excess sunlight just by putting sugar directly on them. So they have more energy to do everything. And the fish, which is a super powerful growth hormone, makes them just take off and go crazy. 
So if you want the, you know, if you want to win a record with speed or size, this is what you would do. It's what makes the giant pumpkins break 500 pounds. Just you can apply that as often as like by spraying it on the leaves. Okay. So the most popular varieties being sold. Now I mentioned uh, Big Boy, uh, Big Boy, which was one the first real popular one made by Burpee. Um, well, it turns out that one of the Boy tomatoes is the best-selling one in the U.S. Still, it's called Better Boy. That came out in the 60s, late 60s, might have been early 70s, and it's still the best-selling tomato. Not here. I mean, this is because, you know, Burpee is Midwest company, so in the Midwest, they said, you know, 90% of the tomatoes they sell is still Better Boy. And it is a good-sized, you know, 10, 12-ounce tomato, and it's very few diseases. It's fine. I mean, I haven't really grown this for 20 or 30 years, but it's it's a good tomato, and it's reliable in the Midwest with their uh, situation with the rain and all that humidity. It, it's pretty darn good. Uh, Big Beef, which came out in the late 80s, um, again, they said that's a miracle of modern genetics. Uh, the one thing you'll notice when you grow a Big Beef it doesn't look real. <laughs> the fruit is perfectly round, like a plastic, red plastic ball. And you look in the garden, you go, is that edible? <laughs> they're pretty good. I wouldn't say it's the best tomato I've eaten, but they're, they're pretty good. People like them. Uh, I like it better and better, boy. And that's one that in my yard lived four years. Now, another one in the boy series is Lemon Boy. Uh, and I would have to say... And I have Lemon Boy's, Lemon Boy's yellow, big yellow tomato. Um, this is the best producer I've ever seen. Most people tell you that. It just makes hordes of tomatoes. And they're not bad. They're milder than the red ones. But they're pretty good. And it's, it's an incredible producing tomato. So we still carry it for that reason. It's still popular because it'll just outproduce by weight. I mean, you just can't... <laughs> You just get pounds, and I mean, just you can fill up buckets with this one. So, Lemon Boy is still a great one. Now, there was a tomato that they brought out a while ago called Tough Boy. Probably a bad name for a tomato, but Burpee didn't create this one. I don't, I don't believe. I might be wrong on this, but I believe that this is the other name for Momotaro which is a Japanese hybrid, which is our best-selling tomato for the last 20 years. So Momotaro, um, literally in Japanese, that means peach boy. But it's, he was a folklore character that was known for his toughness. So Momotaro is actually tough boy. And we, th we th it appears to be, we're not positive. <coughs> But Momotaro means tough boy, uh, and it's and they call it that as a tomato because it's got skin that uh, can withstand. You know, it's, it's commercial tomato. It's withstand abuse of being thrown around the stores and all that. So it's got a little tougher skin than most. But uh, and it was supposedly made not to roll off the shelf, so slightly flattened sides. Um, but it turned out to be our, when it came out, it was really, really tasty. You know, it had that combination of sweetness and acidity that makes it a nice, strong, sweet flavor. Not just bland, but strong and sweet. Um, and it became our best-selling tomato. Over the years, um, something happened to it. And we finally found out over the years they heirloomized it. So the original Momotaro was a Japanese hybrid. But they got tired, someone got tired of spending the money on the seeds, so they created an heirloom version of it. So over here is the heirloom version. I have it somewhere. And we 
find that it's not quite as tasty anymore. So we keep going back somewhere around here somewhere. Uh, so the hybrids have this Japanese tag on them. So these are the original ones. They cost more. We make them a dollar more because they're more ex much more expensive. Uh, but they have the original flavor because it's the original hybrid instead of the heirloom version, which can drift. The Gen X can drift a bit. Now, there's another version of it that people like, too. It's the Momotaro Gold, so kind of a yellowish oranges tomato uh, that some people like better. So there's Momotaro, Momotaro Gold. And then there's a new one called Reika, which they claim is even better than the original Momotaro. So we're carrying this one now, Reika. But the internet says it's supposed to be an improved Momotaro. It's apparently a little bigger too. They're calling this a beef steak. This I can't read. Let's see Japanese label. So those are real, real popular ones that are high. So all these are hybrids. Um, are any of them early or are they all? Not exceptionally early. Now here's an early one. So this is Jet Setter. Well, okay, I forgot to mention. So Early Girl was developed in the late 60s, early 70s also. And that was early. And that's always been a good one. It's got a similar flavor to Momo Charles, sweet and tart, and maybe a little bit smaller fruit, but it's close. I, I kind of think Early Girl and Momo may be related somehow, but um, Early Girl has always been a good one. Momo Charles has been a great one. Uh, Jet Setter is supposed to be a new version, new hybrid that's supposed to be uh, uh, better than Early Girl, but you know it takes decades to figure that out. So Jet Setter. Another early one. <clears throat> so the early tomatoes, which are just faster and, and they can set fruit under a little bit cooler. Oh, I forgot to mention that. Okay. So tomatoes, the flowers, when they bloom, there are certain temperatures where they set their fruit better. They, they go from flower to fruit. Otherwise, the, the flowers just drop off and you get nothing. So the temperature range is 55 degrees at night to about 85 degrees during the day. If it gets either below 55 or above 85, the flowers kind of mess up. They don't, they're not perfectly formed. Now, there are ways you can get around that when it's real hot. You know, shake the plant real good to get that pollen to move. But what apparently it happens, the flowers hang down. At the right temperature range, the female portion is here. The pollen from the males is there, and it falls right on the female part. By gravity, just falls right on it, and it makes the fruit. They say when the temperatures get too hot or too cold, the female part's too short. The pollen misses, and you don't get much fruit set. So at the right temperatures, the female part is longer than the males in the same flower, and you get fruit set real well, 55, 85. So that's coming up in about a month, month and a half. I don't know, every year it's different. So sometime in April we get, and, you know, three or four years ago, it was right now. <laughs> you know, it was, we, were getting 50, we weren't getting cold nights at all. Right now it's, it's probably 50 at night, uh, and last week it was, what, 39 at night, 35 at night, too cold. But everybody wants to get their plants ready to go, nice big plants. By the time we hit this range, then you get a huge crop. So a lot of people start even in January. They want to get the biggest tomato plant they can by the time we get to these temperatures. And when you get above 85, which last year hit right at 4th, you know, 4th of July and suddenly it was really hot, then it's, they stop making new fruit. So... Um, so that crop ripens sometime between May and August. 
and then we get the right temperatures again late September, some years not until October, and then you get your fall crop going. Now there's some tomatoes that can set fruit at high temperatures, Cherokee purple, some of the ones meant for the hotter, hotter climates. But most tomatoes operate best at these temperatures. So, so early in the year and late in the year, the, these can handle the cooler nights better than the other ones. Now, didn't mention the um, cherry tomatoes. So those are, the, of course, the small ones. And I think we sold out this week, but one of the original ones from a long time ago, and I think, and it wasn't a hybrid with Sweet 100. I grew that in the 1980s as the first tomato plant I grew as a kid, or as an adult, really. And uh, that was exceptional, and still is pretty good. They have Sweet Million now, uh, but Sweet 100 still is awful good. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's a hybrid or not. I don't think it is. The most popular tomato in the world supposedly is Sun Gold, which is a yellow cherry tomato. And I didn't really know that that was created in Japan. Um, yeah, uh, according to the literature, it was a Japanese hybrid. Now, it has faults. I mean, it is really sweet and good. The problem with Sun Golds is when you wash them, they all split. The fruit splits really easy, so it is a problem. So in Japan, they created a new one called Chika. I'm not sure the spelling on that. <clears throat> no C. Chika cherry. Super sweet. It is good. Uh, our plant made it through this winter really well. It's full of fruit right now, and it's really good fruit, really sweet. So now one of the big things that they did in the, in the industry in the last 20 years is they created the grape tomatoes. The disadvantage of the cherries in general is that you eat them, you know, just pop them in your mouth and eat them like grapes, but they squirt. So they're a little messy and they can be really messy. So what they did, the tomatoes with the least amount of juice in them, which are the paste tomatoes, which are usually used to make sauces. So Roma, and I don't have Roma right now, but I do have San Marzano from uh, Italy. And those are the paste ones. They're usually sh shaped like, instead of being round, they're shaped more like this. But they're thicker walled, fewer, less juice inside. So more to make paste out of. They cross the paste tomatoes with the cherry tomatoes, so you got small tomatoes, cherry-sized tomatoes that don't squirt. And that became the grape tomato. And that became really famous for the salad tray, or the prepared food tray industry. So it, be, it suddenly became a huge industry. The original plant is a hybrid called Juliet. So Juliet was the original grape tomato. where they crossed a uh, paste tomato and a cherry tomato to get it. And then they developed a lot of heirlooms off of uh, uh, Juliet. So you have red grape, green grape, yellow grape. They all had to have Juliet as the parent, or one of the ancestors to them, because this was the original grape tomato. Now, I don't know if I have a single determinant tomato here. So um, most of these tomatoes are indeterminate. They grow in the style I showed you. They continue to grow up. Um, as they grow, they bloom, and then they, the fruit forms down lower on the stem, but they continually do that. So there are always new flowers at the top, at the end of the stem, um, developing fruit further down, and at the lowest part of the stem, you have the ripe fruit. And they'll just do that in the entire year if the temperature and conditions are fine. The, that's called indeterminate. It just keeps on going. 
they determine tomatoes act like pepper plants. If you've ever grown peppers, what they do is they make a lot of branches, like instead of growing one stem as the primary stem, the determined tomatoes tend to branch off very evenly like a tree. Each stem blooms and fruits at the same time. And the people who want those are the farms that do canning. They want to make one harvest. They want to machine harvest them so they all have to be ripe at the same time. So they have determined tomatoes that all ripen. They just pull out the plants, all one crop, and that's it. Now I believe if you pick all these fruit off, they'll make another round of blooms, just like pepper plant. Pepper plants, you, know, you get they, the plants stop growing when they're developing their flowers and fruit. And as soon as you pick all the fruit off, they start growing and make another round of flowers and fruit. Farms don't do that; they just pull them all out, harvest their crop, and start something else. But I believe if you have a determinate plant at your own home, you pick the fruit, it'll start another round of growth uh, and make another crop like the peppers do. But I'm not positive on that, but it may, and it may not be worth it. I mean, most farms, they don't want to wait for that next crop. So, uh, but determinate versus indeterminate, by far, most people want uh, indeterminates. Uh, most determinate ones are the small patio tomatoes uh, that grow in a small pot and don't get very big and make fruit at a small size. Okay, any questions today? Oh, I forgot to mention some of these cages. Yeah, so um, one of the things, they make these cages, and that's pretty inadequate for a regular tomato plant. So usually these break before the tomatoes finish growing because they're welded and their welds are kind of small. It's better than nothing. It'll keep most of the plant off the ground. You know, the plant kind of grows. You direct the stems up and then over the sides. And if you, you know, if you do like most people, just let all the branches grow, then it'll keep most of it off the ground. There's a square cage that's a little bit. This is marginally sturdier. You unfold this, it becomes a square. Has fewer. It's a little thicker metal, fewer welds, so it tends to hold up for a few years. But if you want a really a nice tomato cage that makes sense, that's big enough to grow a decent sized tomato, then these are the uh, real thick metal ones. These should last a decade or so. And they also fold up. So this is a kind of a neat design because it'll fold flat. So you can stick it against the wall somewhere and not have to deal with it. And then when you want to use it, you just unfold it. And stick it in the ground, and it's a pretty good size. And there's no welds on this that I can think of. Except the weld that holds the ends together. But uh, that should last a long time. I mean, there's no rules on tomatoes. Uh, they said if you grow them on the ground, you have less sun burning, but more fruit that gets rotten or more fruit the bugs go after. If you grow them in a cage or on a support, uh, less rotting, more sun burning. So it's, you know, you pick your style of, of doing it. Um, one other note, I have grown tomatoes in a lot of shade. So, you know, most tomatoes are grown in hothouses and it's not 100% sun in there. It's like 80, 90%. Uh, one year, you know, we had used up all our property and we wanted to rotate, but there was no left room left, so we uh, planted our tomatoes on the north side of the house underneath trees. So they got maybe a couple hours of sun at best. They seem to make just as much as the ones in the sun. <laughs> so they don't have to, you know, if you run out of room, don't panic. You can grow a tomato almost any place. Um, I would think if you did them in the more shade, they would have less in the fruit, less sugar, less acids, because they say on fruit trees, you know, they, they've tested fruit on the north side of the trees, um, 
they had less of everything in them, but they tasted the same as the fruit on the south side of the tree that had more stuff in it. You know, so there's more nutritional value on the fruit on the south side or more sun, but the flavor was the same, they said, on the fruit on the north side. So, so if you just like the tomato taste, you may be fine either way. Um, now, in the news, there was an article we read about, I can't remember which university it was, was developing a tomato that acted as sunscreen. So apparently the flavonoids in there, which are cancer protecting, uh, they fed them to mice and exposed them to ultraviolet light, and it had a bit of an effect <laughs> at keeping the mice more cancer free. So I don't know if they're going to market. They said if you ate enough of these tomatoes, it would give you an SPF rating of about two. <laughs> Probably make your skin really orange or something. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you were out there every day and you ate these tomatoes, you mean yeah, fewer skin spots, fewer. <laughs> but that was one. Of, I can't remember what university that was, but you know, they have. I guess they have too much money to do research nowadays. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Right. Size up from right. Right. And um, well, I didn't keep after it well enough, so some, most of them all tipped over at some point. Yeah. Um, and is there any kind of a recommendation for well, you know, prune, keep prune, kind of going along through the season and pruning them to just kind of keep things under control? I mean, are there kind of recommended kind of patterns you adopt for that? Mm, well, as far as yeah, pruning your own plants. I don't know. I haven't. I've been reading what the internet says and what people say, and they said Dude, everyone develops their own style, well, and and none of them are definitely wrong. Don't have to. Yeah, but the only thing is, you know, your plants grow exponentially, so they just keep getting more and more leaves. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, uh, if you do like the greenhouses do, where you just stay with one stem, then you have exactly the same needs the entire life of that plant, which makes sense. Yeah. Especially if you're in a pot, you might just go with the one stem and just keep, you know, um, coiling the stem around your pot, which which is kind of that's kind of a neat style. I kind of like that method. That's kind of like what they're doing on the most intensive fruit orchards now, too, keeping the trees real narrow and you get more fruit per square inch than you would if you just let them go. You can't put two tomato plants together like that, like the trees you're talking about. Huh? No, there's no problem with that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Well, with one stem, yeah, you'd have to, you can, I guess you can weave your stem up the cage and just have it go with one stem. But, you know, the the thing that they do in greenhouses is real unique where they lower the string. Yeah. I mean, you can have a support from your patio roof. They have a little pulley up there. So so it's a little pulley with the oh, coil nice. of string and, and do that. There's certainly ways you can do it. Well, that's a good point. So, okay, so that that's a good point. So, Sunset Magazine about 25 years ago, it's got, a, I think, back in the 90s, they had a report on how to plant tomato plants. So they did the different recommendations, and you know, the oldest one is to plant the tomato plant. You know, have the root ball under the ground and have the tomato plant buried with half its stem underground and it roots out into the soil, you know, pick the leaves off and it roots out that way. So they tried that method to see if that made much difference. Of course, versus one that was just planted this way, right at ground level. 
Well, they said, and then they also tried where they scored the root ball and so that they, you know, cut out sections of it to make more surface area for the roots to get out of. They said the only method that made any difference to the plant at all was when they split the root ball in the ground and fillet it open like that with a plant like this. So they said this method where they split it from below and filleted the roots to the sides made more difference than any of these other ones. Well, in our talking about dirt and everything, oxygen is highly important. So you get the roots closer to the surface, yeah, they grow faster. So, you know, commercially in, in hothouses, you know, though some will grow, well, they usually use a foam, plastic, so it's very airy. That oxygen, more oxygen to the roots, the more vigorous the growth of the roots, the faster the plant operates. Or they use sponge rock or sand or something that's really airy. So the more oxygen you get to the roots, the faster that plant can grow. Well, if you flay the root ball so that it's closer to the surface, uh, yeah, it takes off much quicker. Or if you just surround it with a lot of our real airy pumice rock stuff that we have, it shouldn't be great. So oxygen, so that made sense to me. None of these other things gave more oxygen to the roots, especially if they use regular potting soil, which is oxygen deficit soil, really. <laughs> Most potting soils have less air than the ground does. So, um, so none of these would help it out a lot, but this one uh, did, did, did the effect and yeah, it makes perfect sense why it does. Yeah, but you don't have to. You just put it, put it, surround it with our dirt so that it's got more air to it. So, so yeah, doing this made it root out there, but you probably lost these roots down here at the same time. Yeah, well, a lot of yeah, a lot of tomatoes are so weak when you get them, they're floppy because they've been grown in too much darkness. Yeah, I had a friend who um, grew tomatoes for the commercial for farms. He was growing seedlings for farms, and they said the farmers didn't like anything that looked like this. It was too weak, so they would not fertilize their plants. They'd have the wind going in the uh, greenhouses, so these plants were real pale. Uh, windblown but really tough because they had machines doing the planting and this would just be too this would just break up so they'd have to have these real tough little yellow tomato plants that they would plant on the farms so that was their specialty <laughs> so it's a whole different ball game when you're talking about farming of course now you know in the hot houses they use well grafted tomatoes if you know what, what that is so they found out that there are some tomatoes that have much better roots than the original plants. And they have numbers as names. There's BK, I don't know, there's all kinds of des numerical and letter designations for these real strong tomatoes that have incredible roots. So they take the plants when they're this big and they have the um, seedling tomato, the root stock tomato plant growing from seed too. And they'll cut this one off and graft it onto the other one. The way they do that is they just snip it off and snip off the top of the other one and have a, you know, those little plastic, clear plastic tubes that are out there. They cut them and then slice them down one side so they're like this little tiny clip. Ha you know, tube that's been sliced, like a straw tube that's been sliced open on one side. And they can just put these two tomato plants together with that little clip around them. It's just a little plastic tube that they open up and clip. it's cut on one side, so they just clip it over, have them in a greenhouse, humid greenhouse for a few days, and it heals. And now you've got the best root system that you can get, which doesn't make good fruit at all, with the best top that makes the best fruit. So a lot of the uh, greenhouse growers, to make their crops live longer, they will graft the best roots and the best tops. Those plants cost like three or four times as much. Yeah. Uh, you know, usually yeah. on the retail market, 10 bucks. You can buy them for 10 or 12 dollars. But they can make a difference. In fact, I, sh I should have mentioned this. 
So the, what, the tomato plant that started the heirloom craze back in the 80s and 90s, and I didn't even mention it, Brandywine. Um, generally around here, the Brandywine tomatoes are big beefsteaks. These are Brandywines here. The original one was kind of pinkish reddish, and the, other, and the newer ones are yellow and red. Um, when you eat them, they taste like, I don't know, they taste like tomato soup. Kind of a creamy flavor. But, you know, the plants I've grown over the years, they make like one or two tomatoes. That's it. <laughs> the real poor, per you have to have a big yard to grow a lot of brandy wine fruit. Well, we tried them on a, gra we, tried we got some grafted ones once. Things produced a dozen fruit, like way more than they did on their own roots. So apparently it's a problem with brandy wine's roots. The root system is not very good on that plant. And if you graft them, so, you know, a lot of the greenhouse growers grow heirloom tomatoes because they make a lot more money on them. They, they buy the ones that are grafted. I think uh, Rogers Gardens, even Armstrong sometimes carries grafted tomatoes, but, you know, you're spending over 10 bucks a plant. So if you, have, if you don't have the room, it may be worth getting a grafted tomato. If you have the room, just plant more tomato plants. But... Uh, yeah, it made a difference, and they're usually, the roots are so strong, the plants usually make it over winter. Uh, and, of course, hothouses, they want their plants to go for years um, so that they use a special root stock for that. So grafted tomatoes, uh, we've got them maybe twice. The first time we got them, we got them from a nursery up in Oregon. They did a good job because they're the ones that do them from hothouses. Uh, a few years ago, we got some from just a regular retail supplier and a uh, lousy, lousy uh, results. It wasn't worth all that money. You have to do a good job with them if you're going to do them. Uh, basically, it was a soil issue. The people who grow for hothouses know they've got to use soil as good as ours. Retail, they're using junk, and it just wasn't, the plants just weren't doing well. So we kind of gave up on those. So, oh, Cherokee, Cherokee purple or yeah, that's a that's still a very popular heirloom. I'll mention one though. Um, so the people who develop the big boy tomatoes, real famous big boy, uh, they said one of the breeders was on his deathbed and he mentioned what was. I guess he had to get it out. He just had to let people know what got him the flavor. So the flavor of, of Big Boy, they said, was due to black crim. So black crim is an heirloom from Russia. And I do have some, I think I have some here. Yeah. Uh, this is about the ugliest fruit you'll ever grow. I mean, it is really, it's got, um, we call it, uh, cat, it's cat-faced. So it's got all these creases and swirls in the skin. Uh, it cracks easily. Uh, it looks like it's totally bruised. It's kind of a greenish, purplish, a gray, well, green and purple, a little bit of red in there maybe, but uh, really ugly fruit. The flesh inside is kind of greenish with red in the middle. Tastes like it's been salted and smoked. So it's got this really incredible flavor. So first time I ate this, first time I grew it in my yard, I had nine tomato plants. The birds were just all over this one. They wouldn't let us eat a single one that wasn't pecked. They just kept going after the black. They loved the black creme too. <laughs> so, you know, we knew uh, this is a great flavor. Um, so black creme was for many years the top taste test winner at a lot of taste offs because it's real unusual. Um, the one that usually wins nowadays is a much prettier one, is uh, Black from Tula. I guess that's in Russia too, or that area of the world. So that's the one that wins a lot of taste, but there's a lot, of, usually it's the black tomatoes that win the taste test, because they've got that real unusual smoky flavor. Almost tastes like it's half rotten already, but it's unique. So... And they look black because the flesh inside is green. So green, red skin under, with f green flesh underneath it looks blackened. 
and there is the black cherry tomato which is really really good although again they're seed grown so they're varieties so if you come across a good a good um, offspring or a good plant you might want to keep because we've had black cherries that were really really good and black cherry tomatoes that weren't so didn't have that black flavor so they're certainly coming out with uh, different versions of it but the black tomatoes yeah real famous uh, striped ones so if you come across a striped one this is green zebra there's Aunt Ruby's German green they're striped the striped ones, what they seem to uh, combine is both sweet and, and, and acidity in the same bite. So parts of the flesh are very sweet, and other parts are very s s acidic or tart. And it gives you a nice uh, overall flavor, too. Most of the yellow ones, like Sun Gold, are, are considered sweet and mild, although I'm not sure if it's actually true, if it's just... Um, visually it looks that way so you kind of mine kind of thinks it's that way but most of the yellow and orange tomatoes are considered milder flavor okay I, th I think that now covers just about everything all right thank you um, well here's another local famous one just to let you know, San Diego Red. So you know those fields of tomatoes you go as you go to on the five freeway towards San Diego? This was developed for those fields because it's so misty there that the tomatoes, they were just losing them. They would grow them and then the mist from the ocean would just make them get all diseased. So San Diego Red was developed for that stretch of the highway. So if you live near the coast, this may be a good one for you. Um, so I do have the San Marzanos here. Yeah, that's pretty much all we have this week. So our, you, our, most of our tomato suppliers will grow at least 20 or 30 varieties each supplier. We have, get tomatoes from about four suppliers by the end of this month. And that's when it, the kind of the variety of tomatoes peaks out around late March into about mid-April. And then after that, it slowly tapers off through the summer months. We'll, we'll always have a few tomato plants during the summer. Oh, I should mention one more bug. So there's a um, few things that happened in the last 10 years. Uh, 2015, San Diego lost 50% of their tomato crop, and Baja lost 80%. There's a new disease out there, and I can't remember the name of it, Solanobacter something or other that affects tomatoes and potatoes. It's being spread by a bug that has been always been around, but it has increased in numbers. It's a little, I think it's potato psyllid. If you know what a, oh, I can't remember the name of that bug that's famous in the Midwest that buzzes real loud in the summer, uh, cicada. This looks like a miniature cicada. So if you see a bug on your tomato plant, it looks like a tiny little cicada, you know, size of an aphid, maybe like a big aphid. That's the potato psyllid. It can transmit a disease that slowly kills off the entire plant. And we saw it hit us around 2016 you know my tomato plants were all doing well in my backyard and suddenly they all branch after branch would just wither away we go okay what what in the world's going on we thought it might be a root disease but the plants regrew after that and we had a good fall crop well that's what this bug it introduced it's that disease will cut off the circulation where it feeds and you lose that stem you don't lose the plant you lose that stem so it's just wiping us out um, I don't know if there's anything you can do about this bug. Now, commercially, the only way they can stop it commercially, because it was, it was killing the farms, absolutely wiping out the farms, they put a systemic in the ground before they plant their crop. Uh, I'm not a proponent of systemics for food. <laughs> you know? 
but they're using merit, imidacloprid, and um, it, this psylla would take one bite and it would kill it. So it couldn't really go from plant to plant to plant and spread the disease. It'd go into the farm and it, and it would kill them right in the first aisle. It would kill them all. So that disease, even if it was around, couldn't make it past the first row of tomatoes. But that's what they have to do uh, in those farms to keep those plants alive is put a systemic in the ground to stop this bug. So be aware it's out there. So if you see this little pest, look up cicada. It looks like a miniature cicada on your um, on your plant, uh, and it can spread a disease that can wipe them out. I mean, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. Just replant a little later, throw the plants away and replant. But that disease is out there. Yes. Well, if you spray spinosad on any bug, it'll kill it, but the residue won't kill a sucking bug. Sucking bugs, the oil will kill off about 90% of them, but it doesn't leave any residue either, so they just come in the next day, and if they're in the neighborhood, they'll just wipe you out. Um, I don't know, I haven't heard too much. I mean, a couple years ago, it must have been really bad, because we had a lot of customers saying the same thing. Middle of summer, their plants would just collapse and they would lose the rest of the crop. They'd get the early crop, and, and later on it would just mess it up. So we don't know if there's much you can do about this, but start your plants early before the bug gets really nasty out there. Then, then there's, there's also the bug called that came in four years ago called chili thrips. Now this one comes in late too. So this one is in August, August through October. So you can get your, your main tomato cropping without any problem. But what chili thrips do is they go on the new growth of any susceptible plant, and there's like 300 different kinds of plants we grow that are susceptible to chili thrip damage, but they just mess up the new growth. I mean, chili thrips is most devastating on roses. So if you have roses in your garden in, in August and September, all the buds shrivel up, this bug is doing that. But it just thrips, again, they slice and dice the most tender part of the plant, which is a new growth, and whatever oozes out, they suck it up, and that's how they eat. Well, when you do that on all the tips of the branches, yeah, you're, the ends of the branches fizzle, just turn brown and dry up. Um, fortunately, it's not the time you're when your, your tomato plants are making their main crop. And fortunately, you can control chili thrips with spinosad. Um, it, spinosad lasts two weeks. Of course, your plant's always grown new growth every week that's unprotected. So a lot of people do is they, even though uh, neem oil is not as effective against the chili thrip as this is, one of the things people are doing are one week they spray this, the next week they spray this, they go back and forth, and that will, this will probably control some of the thrips. So just to keep your plant as clean as you can, you can use these two. But again, chili thrips usually don't, aren't around until it gets really hot. If you're in Florida, they come around in June. Fortunately, in California, they're, they don't show up until August or late July. Whenever it's hot, it has to be hot for several weeks before they show up, fortunately. So those are two real nasty critters that we have nowadays, probably due to international travel. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank